Hello, I'm Jonathan Lindner. Uh, I'm going to be giving this uh, presentation on contrast psychocardiography, the bubbles and how we image them. This is actually the first of a series of presentations that are going to be provided on uh, contrast echocardiography uh, by the American Society of Echo. Uh, the topics range from the basic principles of contrast uh, agents and how we image them, which is this lecture, but subsequent uh, lectures are going to be given on clinical applications of contrast uh, echo, as well as how to seamlessly incorporate the uh, technology into the uh, busy echocardiography laboratory. So please be on the lookout for uh, subsequent uh, uh, lectures that are being given on this uh, topic. I'll first begin with my uh, disclosures, which are uh, listed here. Um, one thing we will be talking about in this uh, presentation are uh, off-label uses of uh, contrast in the practice of echocardiography. Here are our learning objectives uh, for this uh, program. Number one, to explain microbubble contrast agents, to explore the, the contrast-specific imaging technologies that have been developed and that are on uh, most commercially available ultrasound systems. Uh, we're going to also review how to optimize images. Uh, and then lastly, uh, to recognize some of the microbubble ultrasound interactions, which are really necessary for you to understand how contrast ultrasound is used to assess perfusion, as well as some of the newer applications, such as gene therapy, uh, drug delivery, uh, et cetera. Microbubble contrast agents are generally gas-filled particles uh, that circulate through the uh, bloodstream. This is microscopy just illustrating uh, a contrast uh, agent. Uh, note on the uh, lower left is a, uh, a scale showing you a uh, 5 micron bar. Uh, and uh, please observe that most of these microbubble agents that have been developed for human use are smaller than the size of uh, five microns to allow them pass through the smallest uh, blood vessels of your body. Now, ultrasound contrast agents uh, have been approved worldwide for various applications. Uh, in the United States, really our only uh, approved application is to opacify the left ventricular chamber and to improve the delineation of LV endocardial borders so that we can better assess wall motion, left ventricular volumes, uh, masses in the heart, et cetera. Uh, other countries have other applications that involve liver imaging and even uh, bladder imaging, uh, but those have not been improved in the United States. Now, listed here, here are some images that essentially show you, uh, at a most basic level, what these contrast agents are used for. On the left-hand side, you can see the what we typically think about in terms of contrast applications, which are taking essentially a bad image, one that is really too poor to be able to interpret what left ventricular size, left ventricular function is. And the administration of contrast uh, allows us to be able to see the endocardial borders much better to get a better indication of exactly what LV systolic function is, both on a global as well as regional basis. Now, on the right side um, is another uh, essentially approach to contrast ultrasound, which is not necessarily taking a horrible image and making it interpretable, but taking a mediocre image where on the left-hand side you can see that uh, you can, there are subtle clues that left ventricular function is probably normal. The, the descent of the mitral annulus looks uh, pretty normal. Uh, if you could look at TAPSI, you, you'd probably, uh, you see that RV function is also normal. Uh, the EPSS of the mitral valve may be normal. But really we're not able to, to, to see certain portions of the heart like the lateral uh, left ventricular borders. And so the administration of contrast in, in this subject allows us not just to confirm that left ventricular systolic function is okay, but to really be able to see with great clarity uh, uh, segmental wall motion uh, as well. And this is very important because the idea is not just to be able to make an uninterpretable study into interpretable, but to actually uh, increase reader confidence. And in specific uh, situations, as we'll talk about later, there are situations where you, the reader confidence has to be very high and every single segment has to be well visualized. Now, at the top is, is what we've already discussed, which is the approved applications for contrast in the United States. There are also off-label applications. Um, some of the agents actually do have Doppler enhancement as, a, as an indication, but some of them do not. But ultrasound contrast agents are also used for myocardial perfusion imaging, uh, for vascular imaging such as uh, the detection of vasovasorum inside of atherosclerotic plaques, 
uh, uh, mass or tumor perfusion imaging. And then there are certain microbubble agents that are being developed uh, on an experimental basis for molecular imaging that are targeted to specific disease processes. We're certainly not going to be talking about all of these in this lecture, but I just wanted the, the learners to know that there are many other applications uh, for contrast to echo besides just enhancing uh, the, the uh, blood pool within the heart. Listed on this slide is the uh, uh, basic principles of contrast echocardiography. So as you see with number one, we transmit an ultrasound pulse, and an ultrasound pulse is just a high-pressure peak and a low-pressure nadir, which gets uh, transmitted uh, over space. But contrast ultrasound is not like conventional ultrasound in that normally what we do is we send out ultrasound and we just listen for backscatter, the reflection of ultrasound off of tissues. With contrast ultrasound, what's happening is, is because the microbubbles that we use as contrast agents are smaller than the wavelength of ultrasound and are about 5,000 times more compressible than the tissues around them, the bubbles will oscillate. They'll vibrate in the ultrasound field, as you're seeing in this uh, high-speed video microscopy that was provided by Lisa Villanueva. And so when that happens, sound does not merely bounce off of the bubbles, but it's actually transmitted back by the bubbles. So you can think about each bubble as being a little miniature acoustic uh, emitter. And then those signals are received by the ultrasound system. Now, there are special ways of processing the ultrasound system, the, the ultrasound signal from these microbubbles, and we'll talk a little bit more about these. Now, another way of showing this, uh, the same process, uh, is under number two, which just shows you superimposed the ultrasound pulse in the dashed line and the microbubble uh, diameter or volume uh, superimposed. And you can see during the high-pressure peak, the bubble essentially becomes compressed. And during the low-pressure nadir, when the pressure is low, the bubble expands beyond its normal diameter. And this is what essentially produces the oscillation of the microbubbles. Now, this is a little bit of an oversimplification. There's a lot of processes that happen during this. For example, uh, gas, gas inside of the microbubbles can be condensed during the compression phase. There can be buckling of the shell. All of these things are, are things that actually take energy to do and to undo. Uh, but suffice it to say that it's actually this ringing of the microbubble that produces the ultrasound signal that we receive. Now, listed on this slide are really the four main uh, characteristics of microbubbles that set them apart from each other. Uh, the first characteristic is size, the mean size of the microbubbles, but also the size distribution, how broadly the size varies between bubbles. A second uh, uh, characteristic is the shell. So most of these microbubbles, in order to keep them uh, as nice, plump packets of gas that will, uh, that will produce a strong signal, will have a shell. And the shells of microbubbles have, have ranged from uh, lipid shells to uh, proteins such as albumin shells, uh, polymer shells, all types of different shells. And they each behave a little bit differently in an ultrasound field. They also each behave a little bit differently in terms of their ability to, to keep gas within them. Now, there is usually gas within, uh, within a, a bubble. That's what makes it a bubble. Uh, most of the gases are not air. Air is mostly composed of nitrogen and oxygen. These are very small molecules that diffuse out of bubbles very readily. So instead, generally what we've used are gases that will not leak out of the microbubbles quite as readily. Now the fourth uh, uh, characteristic that sets microbubbles apart from each other uh, is the preparation. And by that I mean really two different things. Number one, for commercially produced microbubbles, they're produced in different uh, 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 methods. But more importantly for the user, um, for you to prepare microbubbles, there are different processes that you have to go through in order to prepare, prepare them for uh, use in a patient. For example, some of the agents require activation. Some of them require reconstitution with uh, uh, liquid. And some are just sitting there in a vial in liquid form ready for you to uh, uh, drop and administer to a patient. So there are differences in commercially produced microbubble agents in terms of all of these characteristics. And listed on this slide are examples of commercially produced microbubble contrast agents. The first four on the list are ones that have been approved at some time uh, in the United States for, for use in humans. The top three, Optison, Definity, and Lumison, are all 
uh, agents that have been approved and are, at the time of this recording at least, are currently available uh, uh, for use in the United States. They're currently being marketed. Now, what you can see is that there are differences in the shell between all of these uh, different agents. They range from lipid to albumin to uh, different polymers. The gases inside of them are listed here as well. And as I mentioned previously, these are generally gases by virtue of having a relatively large molecular weight. They're bigger gases than nitrogen or oxygen. They're also not as soluble as uh, nitrogen and oxygen. And because of that, they like to stay within the bubble. They don't leak out quite as, as readily. Um, there are also inert gases that are, are uh, safe to use in humans. So you have to consider not just the fact that it's a stable gas, but that it's also uh, safe to use in humans. And then finally, on the right-hand side, is the uh, mean size uh, given in diameters for each of these uh, microbubble agents. And you'll note that they're all pretty small microbubbles. The, the whole purpose of actually having a shell around the microbubble is not just to keep the gas with, uh, within the, the bubble, but it's actually to, to help stabilize the microbubbles during the process of making them. It's to reduce the surface tension and allow the microbubbles to be small and to control the size distribution when they're being made. And the reason why small is good is that small is safe. Okay? So a, a microbubble, a larger microbubble will give a higher, larger acoustic signal up to a point, but we do not want microbubbles that are so large that if you give them by intravenous injection that they won't make it over to the left side of the heart into the systemic circulation. Now, I've listed commercially produced microbubble agents. You need to know also that there are non-commercial contrast agents that are used both in humans as well as in preclinical uh, uh, research. Uh, there are other lipid and albumin microbubbles that were not listed on the, the uh, last slide that are being made by investigators. But there are also things other than microbubbles, and these include uh, nanoparticles that are emulsions of these um, high molecular weight gases that are, are sometimes actually in a liquid form, multilamellar liposomes. So these are essentially... Uh, sub one micron, so uh, 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 particles that are less than one micron in diameter, and they're generally filled with uh, fluid phase, but they do have a little bit of gas entrapped with, uh, within them. Multilamellar just means there's mul multiple shells within them, kind of like the layers of an onion. Uh, there are newer phase transition contrast agents that are essentially nanoparticles less than one micron in diameter that get converted from liquid phase to gas phase and become larger upon uh, ultrasound uh, activation. Uh, photoacoustic contrast agents, so photoacoustic imaging is to use light that goes into tissue and uh, it produces some sort of, of an event that produces sound. It's essentially like lightning, where you have light that then produces heating and expansion of the air and that produces sound. We can do this in the, the uh, body and we have contrast agents that will actually amplify that process. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there are targeted microbubbles that are, are being made for molecular imaging, which we will not talk about uh, today. Now, the composition of both the commercially produced as well as some of these non-commercially produced microbubbles determines a lot of very important things, one of which is the stability. And by stability, I mean uh, after you bought an agent, how, how long is its shelf life? But also in vivo stability. When you inject in these contrast agents, how long do they circulate in the bloodstream? And how long do they, as they're circulating, do they remain acoustically active and detectable? There's also practical issues, that is, steps to preparation before you inject them into a patient. So the different microbubbles, by virtue of their composition, may require you to do different things to get them ready for human use, there are safety issues. Uh, the behavior in the, the, the microvascular micro, microvasculature is different between the different contrast agents. And actually, the SNR, the signal-to-noise ratio, how much acoustic oomph you get from these microbubbles, the signal you get, really varies according to all kinds of uh, differences in the microbubbles, such as the gases or the shell or the size of the microbubbles, as well as their acoustic robustness, which means Essentially, how hard do you have to drive microbubbles uh, to, to make them ring so that you can detect their signal? Now, 
One basic principle of uh, microbubble agents, both in terms of their safety, but also in terms of your ability to prefer, perform perfusion imaging, is that their size must be small enough to pass through the microcirculation. And they cannot, to a large degree, stick to anything in the microcirculation, such as to, to endothelial cells. So at the top is something called intravital microscopy, where I've just uh, fluorescently labeled a lipid microbubble agent. And you can see it passing through uh, the smallest blood vessels of a muscle there uh, with no trouble whatsoever. These microbubbles behave just like red blood cells through the microcirculation. And you see that in the graph off to the right, that the relationship between the velocity of red cells through capillaries and arterioles and venules, which is what I'm showing you in the, the video, is the same for red cells as for microbubbles. And because of that, we can do things such as perfusion imaging, which is shown on the bottom, where you can see microbubbles starting to come into the, the leg of a mouse in this, this example. And you can see the, the leg becomes dark when we destroy microbubbles, and they just flow back into the, the muscle. And you can actually see a little microvascular angiogram before that ground glass perfusion in the capillary bed takes over that these things just pass readily through the microcirculation of the tissue. So in order for the microbubbles to do this, they have to be small. So the smallest blood vessels of your body, the, the, the capillaries, in a human, they're about anywhere from about 5 to 7 microns. So most microbubble agents have a mean diameter that's less than 5 microns. Now, that doesn't mean that all microbubbles look the same. So on the top, I have uh, two examples of two different microbubbles that I've, met, I've uh, analyzed with a Coulter counter. On the left is bubble A, and you can see that it has a, uh, a mean diameter of 1.8 microns. But if you look at the distribution of bubble sizes, you can see that as we approach one micron, which is the detection threshold for this technique, that the bubble diameter keeps on going up as you move from right to left. That means that there's a ton of microbubbles that are actually smaller than one micron, which we call nanobubbles. These are, are less detectable. They don't, they don't produce as strong of an acoustic signal. And they're a little bit less stable in the microcirculation. They tend to dissolve a little bit faster because of high surface tension. Okay? On the right is bubble B. And that's a little bit more what we call monodisperse. Okay? The bubble A is polydispersed. Bubble B is a bit more monodispersed where there's a kind of narrow peak right around two microns. And you can see these two microbubbles have about the same mean diameter, but their distributions are a little bit different. Okay? On the bottom, on the left, you can kind of see the polydispersed microbubble agent uh, A, where there are big bubbles, medium bubbles, but a lot of very small microbubbles as well going down to the, the uh, nanobubble range. And on the right is uh, from a publication where they've made a very monodispersed microbubble population. All the microbubbles look exactly the same uh, through almost an inkjet uh, uh, process of producing uh, uh, these bubbles. Now, the advantage of, of using uh, bubble B may be that uh, you know how these things are going to behave and you can tune your ultrasound exactly to the right frequency and, and pulsing mode to detect that microbubble. The issue is that with bubble A, it may be polydispersed, but that may be a little bit better if, uh, if you're using different ultrasound systems and aren't necessarily tuned exactly to where you want to see with a, a monodispersed microbubble agent. So you can see that there can be advantages with either having a polydispersed or monodispersed microbubble agent, depending on how much you know how to tune an ultrasound system for that exact microbubble agent. Now, in terms of image optimization, we're going to talk a little bit about this. One of the key things for you to know is the relationship between microbubble concentration on the x-axis and the signal intensity on the y-axis. And as you start increasing microbubble concentration O in a beaker or in the left ventricular cavity in the blood pool, as you increase the bubble concentration, the signal intensity will rise, but it'll rise to a point where the system becomes saturated. And the reason is, is that each ultrasound system has a dynamic range. The dynamic range is the relationship between how much signal is coming into the ultrasound system from the transducer versus how bright it's displayed on the screen. And when your bubble concentration becomes too bright, you really don't, it becomes too high, you don't gain anything more by increasing bubble concentration further. 
It just becomes very bright and stays bright. If you keep on increasing microbubble concentration, eventually your bubble concentration will become so high that it'll block ultrasound from going through it, and that's called attenuation. And so essentially what you want to do when you're giving these ultrasound contrast agents is really to use things in the optimal range where you are not producing complete system saturation and certainly not creating any attenuation. The optimal range is also even more important when you're doing perfusion imaging where you want to look for different amounts of microbubbles in different parts of the left ventricular myocardium. In this example, you can see that there is the concentration of the microbubble contrast agent is too high. You're filling in the left ventricular apex, but what's happening is there's all this shadowing, this, the, the darkness of the basal portion of the LV that's essentially obscuring the basal lateral wall. So this is an example of having too high of a contrast agent. So those are the two extremes where the bubble concentration is low and the bubble concentration and, and not filling in the LV and the bubble concentration in this case is too high where it's shadowing the left ventricular myocardium. So in this example, we have optimal concentration. So on the left is an image of the left ventricular myocardium. This is an apical three-chamber view. And you can see most of the myocardial segments pretty well, but not really portions of the in distal infralateral wall. The administration of the contrast agent on the right allows you to have optimal filling of the left ventricle. Re left ventricle. There is no attenuation of the far field. We're filling in the entire ventricle all the way up to the apex. And so the concentration is optimal, and you can see that the administration of contrast in this example has uncovered the presence of a wall motion abnormality in the distal infralateral wall in this patient that wasn't necessarily that obvious in a non-contrast enhanced image. Now, one of the things you should know is that attenuation from too high contrast agent is not the same thing as attenuation from other things. So, for example, this is an example of rib attenuation on the image on the left. What you can see in this apical uh, uh, three-chamber view is that we have filled in the entire left ventricle. There's no shadowing or attenuation coming from the microbubbles, but there is rib attenuation that's actually uh, taking out portions of the anterior septum. And so what the sonographer has done on the right-hand side is, besides turning off the, the uh, color coding, is to actually move the transducer, just angle it uh, uh, further up, so that we're now getting away from that rib attenuation and able to see the anterior septal wall. So rib attenuation and other forms of attenuation are not the same thing as bubble attenuation, although really they, they do the same thing, which is essentially blocking of ultrasound signals. Now, listed on this slide, I've got some pearls in terms of uh, uh, administering the, the contrast agents that are approved uh, for use in the United States. So, number one, if you want to make contrast happen and have good signal uh, enhancement, you don't want to use tiny IVs and push hard. These bubbles are sensitive to pressure. And so, what you'd like to use are IVs that are uh, 22 gauge or larger, and the more proximal uh, the better. And yes, you can use central lines. Work with your intensive care uh, nurses and make sure you flush well. Uh, but you can use central lines for, for uh, this purpose. Um, if you are performing a lot of outpatient contrast ultrasound, uh, the throughput through your lab is best if sonographers are actually the ones that are trained to place the, the IVs. And you're going to be hearing a little bit more about this from uh, subsequent lectures. Um, if you suspect, only if you suspect the presence of a shunt, a significant uh, uh, a right to left sided shunt should be excluded in patients because that is a current uh, contraindication for ultrasound contrast agents. Remember that left ventricular opacification can be achieved either through small bolus injections of the contrast agent, but it can also be performed with continuous infusions, and each has their advantage. Um, myocardial, per and, and you'll be hearing again more about this. And then remember that when you are performing left ventricular opacification, you can get away with pretty small doses of the contrast agent, but when doing myocardial perfusion imaging, you generally need slightly higher uh, infusion rates of ultrasound contrast agents. And I use the term infusion rates because generally you should be using uh, um, pump infusions of ultrasound contrast agents uh, when doing myocardial perfusion imaging because it keeps the concentration of microbubbles steady in the blood pool.
Now, how do we actually detect microbubbles? So I mentioned previously that the ways that we detect ultrasound contrast agents is a little bit different than just standard backscatter. So the, the, the image on the left, the video clip, is from uh, Peter Burns, as is the, the uh, frequency amplitude histogram on the right, from a microbubble agent. And what you can see is that the microbubble, when you ring it with ultrasound, will, contra- will uh, compress and expand. But often, if you hit the microbubble hard enough with ultrasound, high enough pressure, it'll actually respond non-linearly. Non-linearly just means that essentially the, the diameter or the, the volume of the, the ultrasound microbubble agent is not necessarily linearly related to the pressure applied. Um, the, and you can see that from the uh, pressure versus radius uh, curves that are at the bottom of that video clip. And when this happens, when the bubbles ring non-linearly like this, they actually produce a lot of very strong harmonics. And you see that on the right with all of these peaks. This is the signal that's coming back from an ultrasound contrast agent that was struck at about 2.75 megahertz. So you see the strongest peak is at the fundamental frequency, the frequency that was sent. But you have these multiple different peaks at multiples of the transmit frequency, which are called harmonics, as well as half the send out frequency, which is the subharmonics. And we like to receive a lot of the nonlinear signals, either the, the signals that are occurring within those harmonic peaks or even nonlinear signals that are happening in the fundamental peak in order to better, understand, to better receive microbubble contrast agents and detect them over tissue. Now, one thing to remember is that if you need to strike microbubbles with pretty hard ultrasound, generally greater than around an, a mechanical index greater than 0.1, in order to ring it non-linearly. But if you ring them too hard, microbubbles will be destroyed. And this is a microscopy image showing you microbubbles, and then a single pulse of ultrasound at a mechanical index of around one that's destroying all the microbubbles in the field with one single pulse. Okay? So generally, micro, depending on the microbubble agent, microbubble destruction starts to happen at mechanical indexes really as low as around 0.15 or 0.2. You really get a lot of uh, destruction of most microbubble agents at mechanical indexes greater than 0.5 or 0.6. And so that's something for you to be uh, cognizant about. It does depend on what frequencies you're using as well. But for most uh, uh, conventional echo, those are the uh, mechanical index ranges uh, where we start to see destruction of microbubbles. These images show the impact of destroying microbubbles. They're from uh, the same patient. Uh, ignore the color coding on the, uh, the image on the right. But on the left, what we're doing is we are continuously imaging the microbubble agents as they're washing through the heart using a high mechanical index, 1.3. This is way too high to be using for doing left ventricular opacification. And what you can see is that microbubbles, as they go through the RA and the RV and the LA and then eventually the LV, are continuously being bombarded by high mechanical index ultrasound and are being destroyed to the point where the bubbles can no longer fill the left ventricular cavity. There aren't enough of them surviving in order to to produce full opacification. Without changing the infusion concentration, we've just lowered the mechanical index on the right. And you can see that just with doing that, you can fill in the left ventricular cavity quite nicely. So it's important when you're doing left ventricular opacification really to use Lower, me- lower powers, we're talking about mechanical indexes anywhere from around 0.1 to 0.4 will probably work. Uh, and you don't want to use such a high power that you're destroying microbubbles. You'll sometimes notice that, especially at the left ventricular apex. So at the apex, the bubbles tend to be destroyed a little bit more because of line overlap okay, at the apex. So if you start to see that, even with low power imaging, just move your acoustic focus up to the, the uh, near field, and that tends to make the, each line of ultrasound a little bit thinner at the uh, near field so that you're not getting that apical destruction. So listed on this slide are the different responses, just very generally speaking, for microbubble agents. And let's start down at the bottom. At the very bottom, when we start using very low power imaging, we're talking about mechanical indexes of less than 0.1, what will happen is you will get bubble signal, but it's all linear. Ultrasound gets reflected back at, a, at exactly the same frequency that you sent, the fundamental frequency. And the problem with this is 
it's a very low amplitude signal, and so your, your signal to noise is kind of puny, and we don't use this. Next up is low power imaging, which is anywhere, mechanical index is anywhere from 0.1 to 0.3. When we do this, the microbubbles will oscillate in a nonlinear fashion and start producing those nice rich harmonics that we can actually use uh, to detect signal, uh, the signal from microbubbles with, with uh, a, a nice robust uh, signal to noise ratio. At the high power up at the top, that's where we get our strongest signals. Okay? So when these pulses come in, they not just ring the microbubbles in an incredibly exaggerated fashion, but they tend to destroy the microbubbles. And when the microbubbles are, are disrupted, this is also called inertial cavitation, they produce very strong harmonics. They produce actually a very strong broadband signal, signal even between the harmonic peaks. And that's great. It actually produces very strong signal, and we still use these types of imaging modalities in certain applications. But the problem is for left ventricular opacification, you destroy the microbubbles uh, too much to be able to, to actually fill in the left ventricular cavity, okay? And so the problem with high power imaging up at the top is that if you're using continuous infusion, you get no contrast effect because you're continuously destroying and bombarding it. It still can be used for perfusion imaging by using intermittent imaging where we actually create these long intervals between pulses in order to detect a signal with great robustness in the myocardium. More often than not, though, we're actually using these days low-power imaging where we can ring the bubble, microbubbles in a nonlinear fashion and produce these, these harmonics. The problem with this is the acoustic signals are relatively low compared to the high-power image image, and there's a lot of heterogeneity in the signal within the ultrasound field. You know, an ultrasound field, you, you look at a sector of ultrasound, and actually the power is not homogeneous throughout the whole uh, uh, sector, and so you tend to get sweet spots in the middle and drop off near the edges. And so imaging methodologies have been developed to better detect signal-to-noise of microbubbles over tissue, and that's illustrated here in, in this uh, diagram. So when we're using high mechanical index imaging and we're ringing the microbubbles and destroying them, as you see here in the light green, the bubble signal is very broadband. You see those harmonic peaks, kind of where the tissue harmonics are as well. So in the dark green are, are tissue signals, and you can see the harmonic peak uh, at uh, twice the send out frequency. For the bubbles, you get those same peaks, but you also have a lot of signals in between. And that's because of the broadband signal produced by bubble destruction. And because of that, I've drawn arrows at different areas where it may be possible to detect the microbubbles and get very low tissue and very strong bubble signal. And this is what we're trying to do with contrast ultrasound, especially with perfusion imaging, where we are trying to detect the microbubble signal and really drop out all of the signals that are coming from tissue. Now, with low mechanical index imaging you'll see that the signals for both bubbles and tissue are lower. Now, in order to actually really get very good robust signal-to-noise ratio, we generally have to image bubbles at the harmonic peaks or at the fundamental frequency peak, so the two arrows that I've shown here. And in order to really improve signal-to-noise ratio, it's really ideal to get rid of every single drop of that tissue signal. And so I'll show you a couple of slides demonstrating exactly how we get rid of the tissue signal. First, this is essentially what it looks like when we've gotten rid of tissue signal. These are two different images. One is from a heart imaging the, the uh, myocardium in a short axis. The other is the image that I showed earlier of a mouse leg. And what we're doing is we're looking at bubbles in the left ventricular cavity on the left, but also in the myocardium. And you can see, you're going to see a little flash here, which is a destruction, destructive pulse. So it's a high mechanical index pulse, and you'll be hearing more about this in a subsequent lecture on perfusion imaging. But in order to do perfusion imaging, we have to wipe out all the bubbles in the tissue and watch how fast they come back in. So after the destructive pulse, you can see that the myocardium becomes completely black. The skeletal muscle on the right also becomes completely black so that every drop of signal that you see in there is coming from the bubbles. So in order to do this, we have to eliminate bubble uh, signals that are being reflected back from the tissue. 
And because of that, ultrasound uh, manufacturers have developed these uh, algorithms that will subtract out tissue signal but leave behind the bubble signal. And there's two major approaches by which they've used to do this. This is one of them. This is called pulse inversion imaging. And generally with pulse inversion, or sometimes called phase inversion imaging, what you're doing is you're send, sending a series of ultrasound pulses that are mirror images of each other. So you can see pulse A and pulse B are 180 degree phase shift. They're mirror images of each other. So on the right-hand side, if you have tissue, if A and B just get reflected back from tissue, if you add those two things together, those two pulses as they've come back, they subtract out. And the reason why this happens is that tissue produces mostly linear backscatter when using low-power ultrasound. At the bottom are all the nonlinear signals that come back from microbubble contrast agents. And so these are a little bit less predictable. Um, they, they do not come back looking exactly like A and B. And so when you add these together, they do not subtract out and you start detecting microbubble signal. So this is one way of getting rid of the tissue signal and leaving behind the nonlinear signal coming from the microbubble. A second way of doing this is something called power modulation or amplitude modulation imaging. And here you can see there are two pulses. They are not mirror images of each other. They're actually the exact same pulses, except pulse A comes in with low power, which, remember, produces linear and nonlinear signals. Pulse B comes in at very low power imaging, which should only produce linear signals. So if you have tissue that just reflects, t reflects back ultrasound at these types of, of powers, if you look at the right-hand side at the top, if you take A and you subtract out 2 times B, they will eliminate each other. However, if you have a bubble in the uh, tissue, A, the low power pulse, will produce those nonlinear signals. B, when you hit it with very low power, if you remember, produces just linear signals, so it just comes back looking like the ultrasound pulse. And you can multiply that times 2 and subtract it from A. It does not subtract out. Okay. So those are the two major approaches that we use in order to really get those nice, robust uh, uh, bubble signals without much tissue signal. So when putting all of this to practice, we're producing left ventricular opacification, often uh, abbreviated LVO. The ideas are you need lots of bubbles in the LV cavity, okay? And if, as long as you're doing that with a good infusion rate or a good microbubble dose and your, your mechanical index isn't too high, it's, your, your machine settings don't need to be absolutely perfect, okay? It's very forgiving if you're using medium to low mechanical indexes. It's a very forgiving process. So you don't have to do a, a lot of nebology. One of the ideas when you're doing left ventricular opacification is to make the cavity bright and the myocardium dark. But remember, you still need to be able to see myocardium because remember, what we do when we're evaluating left ventricular function is we look for LV thickening, and you have to see endocardium as well as epicardium to tell thickening. The machine presets that have been, produced, that have been uh, set by your, your manufacturers have had a lot of thought put into them, and they're not bad. Okay? They really aren't. The, a lot of these, these um, uh, companies have put in low-power tissue subtracting methods that I just described, and they're very forgiving in order that, in other words, they're able to produce a lot of bubble signal for you. But remember, you need to, to give ultrasound at low to medium mechanical indexes so that you're ringing the bubbles pretty hard. You may get a little bit of destruction, but at least you're ringing the bubbles hard enough to produce a robust uh, uh, a signal in the LV cavity. Just don't uh, raise it more than around 0.3 or 0.4 where you start getting destruction. You may want to even lower the dynamic range, or on some systems it's called compression. And the reason is, is you kind of want a little bit more of a, a, a black and white. Subtle grayscale information is not needed for left ventricular opacification. It's more important for, for perfusion imaging. And then remember to change your acoustic focus. If you're getting some destruction at the near field, bring that acoustic focus up to the near field. Now, you're going to be hearing a lot more about the clinical applications of contrast ultrasound. And I just want to kind of introduce you to some of these con uh, concepts just so that you can kind of see what optimal images look like as well. 
you're going to be hearing about how contrast ultrasound for left ventricular opacification is really critical where in the situations where you need to have very high accuracy and very high reader confidence. My thoughts on some of these situations are listed here. When you're using echo to evaluate for wall motion abnormalities at rest or during stress, when you're evaluating LV function for qualification for ICD or resynchronization therapy, it's really important for you to have a precise left ventricular ejection fraction. It's also very important to have a precise ejection fraction when uh, evaluating patients who are receiving cardiotoxic drugs like chemotherapy. We want to follow their EFs over time, and so you need to be able to see the LV well. And then there are certain situations where you need to look at LV dimensions and volumes in patients with valve disorders. So these are situations where it's not just good enough to say, yeah, I see things pretty well. Uh, You need to say, I see things very well, and I have a very high level of confidence. So the application of contrast, these ideas are kind of put uh, diagrammatically here. So your use of contrast ultrasound for left ventricular opacification should be justified based on really two different questions that you're asking. One is the list of things on the left side, which is what is the indication for the study? And on the right side, what is the quality of the images? And so green means, yeah, you should probably use contrast agents, and red means, nah, it's probably not going to to help you all that much. So you can see down at the very bottom, if the indication for the study is pericardial constriction or uh, how bad is the mitral regurgitation, the administration of contrast agents, even if you have kind of a poor quality study, really isn't going to help you all that much with those questions. But up at the top, you can see Uh, doing echo for chest pain, you know, in somebody who may be having angina, uh, looking for LV thrombus, stress echo, change in EF for chemotherapy. In this situation, of course, you want to use contrast agents if the images are poor or even of fair quality. But there are certain situations, even if the images are pretty good, you may want to consider using them because uh, there may be one or two segments that you may not see all that well And for these applications, you need to see every segment, and you need to see every segment very well. LV thrombus is a great example of that. So here's an example. This is from a a patient that was admitted with a stroke. Uh, They have known heart failure from ischemic cardiomyopathy, and the LV function was done, or the echo was done to evaluate for LV function and for thrombus. There are clues that the left ventricular function is very poor in this patient. There's not a lot of descent of the mitral annulus. Uh, the mitral valve doesn't open up all that long, uh, early closure of the mitral valve. And so um, you know that the LV systolic function is really pretty severely reduced in this person, and this is a susceptibility for left ventricular thrombus, but you have no way of evaluating whether or not there is a left ventricular thrombus in this patient. Contrast is administered, and these are pretty good doses of contrast agents. You can see on the left-hand image we have completely filled in the left ventricle, Uh, There is a little attenuation, but it really doesn't start until you're at the plane of the the mitral annulus. And you can see with the administration of contrast agent, there's this serpiginous uh, thrombus, kind of a fresh-looking thrombus there at the left ventricular apex that could not be seen by the previous uh, uh, non-contrast enhanced images. Now, here's an example from a patient where you had the same question. So this patient actually was admitted with a stroke. And if you actually look at the left-sided images, you'd say, you know, the images are really all, not all that bad. Uh, they're pretty good images, and I really don't see much of anything at the left ventricular apex, nothing that I'd be willing to call a thrombus with a great deal of confidence. The administration of contrast in this person did two things, which is really highlighted the presence of complete akinesis of the distal septum and apex, but also the presence of a rather large apical thrombus that really couldn't be appreciated in a non-contrast enhanced study. Now, here is an example of uh, left ventricular opacification, which has really made a difference in understanding somebody's left ventricular function. So this is a 56-year-old obese male with chest pain and dyspnea on exertion. And especially if you looked at that apical four-chamber view on the right-hand side, I don't think anybody would actually say that you see a prominent wall motion abnormality. You don't see left ventricular uh, endocardial uh, borders all that well. In fact, they're very poorly seen. But there's nothing that you would say is a a definite wall motion abnormality on that study. 
administration of contrast, and this person actually highlighted the presence of a wall motion abnormality that really couldn't otherwise be seen in the distal anterior wall, anterior septum, apex, as you see on the four-chamber and three-chamber view here, but also the unknown presence of a thrombus within the LV cavity. So a good example of how you've increased reader confidence of knowing what's exactly what's going on, what's causing this person's chest pain, but also the identification of several high-risk features, that is, LED disease, as well as the, pro, uh, the presence of a blood ventricular thrombus. So, these are some of the, the, uh, the um, applications of contrast for left ventricular opacification, and you'll be hearing more about these from the uh, subsequent lectures. You'll also be hearing a little bit about myocardial perfusion. So, myocardial perfusion is used for a lot of different things. These are listed on this slide. Uh, mostly ischemic heart disease for diagnosing acute coronary syndrome or presence of ischemia during stress echo, uh, the presence of microvascular no reflow after uh, an intervention for ACS. So there's a lot of applications that you're going to be hearing about, but it's important for you to know that, the, that, that in order to do myocardial perfusion imaging, you have to know a little bit about the microcirculation and the interaction between ultrasound and microbubbles within the microcirculation. So when imaging with, for, for myocardial perfusion with contrast ultrasound, most of what we're imaging is the stuff within the myocardium. So the blood volume of, of the, the circulation of the heart, the coronary circulation, the arteries and the veins are mostly on the surface of the heart where we're not looking at. We're looking mostly at the stuff within the muscle, which is mostly the microcirculation, which makes up generally about 5 to 8% of the total mass of the heart. It can go up as high as 15% during stress. And most of that is actually in the capillaries. And so in the middle there, you can actually see a capillary bed, and you can see that, the, that most of the blood volume that you see within this uh, small little area here of the heart is actually in the small blood vessels, the smallest blood vessels, which are our capillaries. And that's pretty much what we are imaging when we're administering microbubble agents, and they're passing through the circulation within the heart muscle itself. And so when we do perfusion imaging, and you'll be hearing more about this, the principle is to destroy microbubbles within that microcirculation. And in this video clip, you see that as that flash that comes in that makes the myocardium dark. So we are using one of these, these um, uh, image processing systems that drop out all of the signal from the myocardium itself. And all you're seeing is the bubble signal. So the big flash you see there is the destruction of microbubbles, and then you see them coming back into the microcirculation. And the way that we quantify perfusion is to look at this replenishment phase. So to quantify it, we measure both the rate of replenishment as well as how bright it eventually gets, okay? Now, in order, and, and the curve off to the right kind of shows you what this, this looks like, it's generally fit to a one minus exponential curve. In order to accomplish this, you have to set up your ultrasound system in a specific way that will allow you to produce that flash of ultrasound that you see there at a high enough mechanical index, generally greater than a mechanical index of 0.9, but then also set up your imaging so that after the flash, you're detecting microbubbles with a high signal-to-noise ratio to be able to detect their subtle wash-in back into the microcirculation at lower mechanical index. And that's what I tried to give you here by this lecture, to, to give you a little bit of, of uh, information of exactly how microbubbles act in an acoustic field so that you can do things like this, which is to destroy bubbles at high mechanical index, but also to see them come back in at a lower uh, mechanical index. And you'll be hearing about how to, to use perfusion imaging to detect coronary artery disease and acute coronary syndromes. But there's lots of other little subtle features that you can get out of knowing this relationship between ultrasound and microbubbles. And this is an example. This is apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And we've been able to diagnose apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy through some really interesting tricks using, uh, using ultrasound. So over at the right is perfusion imaging. And you can see that the mechanical index is low, 0.1. And you can see that there is signal in the myocardium. You'll see a destructive pulse that wipes out all the bubbles. And then you can see all the bubbles come back in so that we can be assured that this is 
all muscle that's being perfused. But if you look to the left, we've raised our mechanical index up to about 0.27. And what that does is it actually is a medium mechanical index that destroys microbubbles in the smallest blood vessels of the heart. So if you increase this mechanical index to a medium level, bubbles are continuously being destroyed okay, with this medium mechanical index. But the ones that are moving slower get destroyed more because they're exposed repetitively to ultrasound. Bubbles that are moving fast through slightly larger vessels in the heart, move, they move faster and they don't get destroyed as much because they're, they're continuously being replenished by the faster velocity in them. And so by using this medium mechanical index, you can actually bring out the, the presence of these big intramyocardial arteries or, or large arterioles that are very characteristic of apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that allow you to make the diagnosis in this case. So just one example of how knowing some of the tricks of uh, interaction of bubbles with ultrasound allows you to do some of these, these interesting uh, things. I'll finish up with just some safety issues. Who should not receive contrast? Well, anybody with a major right-to-left intracardiac shunt this does not mean that you need to do agitated saline contrast in every single patient to exclude the PFO. But if you actually see unexplained right, right-sided chamber enlargement and you have a high degree of suspicion for a right-to-left shunt, then you need to exclude it. If there is an allergy uh, to either the contrast agent from before or allergy to blood products for any agent that's made of albumin, in this country that means optosan, you're not allowed to use it for arterial injection, although it is used off-label for that for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy when we're doing septal ablations. And then there are some relative contraindications as well that include pregnancy, religious reasons, patient refusal, of course. Pulmonary hypertension, it's now been shown that pulmonary hypertension is pretty safe to use these contrast agents. Uh, just be aware that you should probably be mindful of the amount that you're using. If you use a ton of it very rapidly, you can slightly increase pulmonary artery uh, systolic pressures, uh, but it, the, the safety studies actually have now shown that it's safe to use in people with significant pulmonary hypertension. Uh, just be very judicious with its use. Uh, the safety of, even though there, there was a black box warning put on many years ago to, to, on these uh, contrast agents, many of the, much of the teeth of these, the, this black box warning have been uh, 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 taken away, have been removed. Uh, and it's on the basis of a lot of studies that have been sh uh, shown by people who, who have been leaders in, in this field uh, of the safety of these contrast agents. This is just some of the, uh, the results from one study uh, with one agent, uh, Definity in this case, that actually showed that of 66,000 do uh, doses of Definity uh, and 12, excuse me, this is Definity and Optison, uh, the title is incorrect, uh, that severe reactions really only occurred in about eight patients, which means about one in 10,000. It's the safest contrast agent, actually, that's used for any imaging, uh, imaging modality. Um, these imaging reactions were, were considered to be what's called anaphylactoid. That means it's an allergic reaction that does not involve IgE. There were no deaths. Um, and there were, in, interestingly, there were no, none of these events in anybody with possible ACS or heart failure. There was a concern that, hey, is the safety uh, a profile of these uh, a little bit more worrisome in people who are more critically ill, and that didn't seem to be the case. So really, you're going to get a really severe reaction in about 1 in 10,000 patients, which is very un uncommon. Again, this is what's called pseudoanaphylaxis, which means it's not mediated by IgE. All microbubbles have the potential to activate complement at their surface. Most of these have been found with the lipid uh, contrast agents and certain lipid contrast agents. Um, a lot of it is not just because it's a, it's a lipid, but also that there's a charge on the surface of these microbubbles. And what that does is it actually produces complement activation on its surface. Now, number three, many of the commercial lipid microbubble agents that have been made actually are being designed to try to decrease this process by putting things such as polyethylene glycol peg on their surface. And so these reactions that can happen with microbubbles, which are sometimes called CARPA, so that's complement-activated uh, 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 activated reactions of the pseudoanaphylactic-like syndromes. They can occur, but they are rare, and really they have not been necessarily associated with any deaths. But because they can occur and are rare, your need laboratory needs to be uh, prepared uh, to deal with any of these reactions if they happen. 
So you need to have certain medications, which are listed here, uh, as well as the, you know, the people who are overseeing the laboratory have to know and have to be trained and be capable of dealing with uh, administration of these agents in case anybody develops any of the symptoms associated with a pseudoanaphylactic reaction, which is generally manifest by shortness of breath, uh, palpitations, drop in blood pressure. Uh, you can have uh, uh, hives uh, and a general feeling of uh, uh, unwellness. So in summary, use of contrast is now considered to be state-of-the-art for echocardiography. The ultrasound contrast agents that we have been, that we have developed and that are commercially produced are among the safest of all contrast agents ever developed for any imaging modality. There are three approved contrast agents available here in the U.S. Use them. There are contrast-specific techniques on your ultrasound system. Learn them. And I suggest that you use all of the resources that are available to you, uh, both through the American Society of Echo, okay, and there are going to be other lectures teaching you about the use of contrast as well as how to incorporate it into laboratory. However, also, don't forget there are many laboratories that use this in a seamless fashion. Go visit those laboratories to figure out exactly how, how the, the process is set up and in what patients uh, contrast ultrasound, either for left ventricular opacification or for myocardial perfusion imaging, is playing a role in improving patient care. Thank you so much for uh, your attention and for uh, viewing this program. Take care and have a nice day.